Okay, friends, if you could uh, take your seats and <clears throat> we'll get going. Um, delighted to see so many people here. Um, I'm not surprised, but I'm delighted. Um, and uh, so welcome. Uh, this is uh, Johan Galtung Day at, uh, at Eshgar. We have Johan here. You know, uh, have the great good fortune to have him here right now uh, to be able to talk to us during lunch, although he's not going to get much to eat. Uh, and um, we'll go here until about 2 o'clock, and then there'll be a break. And then he's going to be back here at 4.30 to talk to students. Open forum. Anybody can talk about anything they want to. And so uh, anybody who'd like to come back is invited, and we'll have uh, probably some other people at that point, too. Um, I also um, want to uh, recognize uh, Diane Perlman. Is she here? Where is Diane? Diane is here uh, as one of the uh, Transcend team. She's the local representative, a Washington, D.C. representative of Tra Johan's organization, Transcend, um, and uh, has set up a whole series of very interesting events for Johan, including one tomorrow at the um, Sias, uh, the Johns Hopkins place on Massachusetts Avenue, where Johan will be talking on a panel with the president of that organization, the director of that organization, and also Ron Fisher. Uh, uh, from uh, not, not tomorrow, no? Is it tomorrow? Diane? Uh, Diane disappeared. We'll find, maybe it's next Tuesday. I think it's December I'm sorry three. if I, that, uh, yeah. I'll, we'll, no, it was a shock for me. We'll correct that, <laughs> we'll, we'll correct that thing. Um, um, uh, I don't think Johan needs very much introduction at this, at this school, um, since you have uh, read him, you've seen him, you've got, many of you had an opportunity to talk to him before, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's a, a mighty, nice thing for us that he has been willing to come and spend a little time of his uh, here when he has such a busy schedule. Going around the world twice a year keeps you kind of busy, uh, which as you probably know he does. And uh, I don't know if Fumi is in the room too. Is Fumi in the room? Uh, and Fumi Agalton is also with us, which is a real delight. So glad to have you here, Fumi. Um, I just want to say that um, Thinking about introducing Johan made me think about, made me recollect the first time, one of the first times I met him, which was at a conference that John Burton uh, produced to ad try to advance the theory of basic human needs. Um, it was, I think, in, uh, in, uh, at Early House. Yes. Um, it was. And uh, it was a sort of all star crowd, you know, there. <laughs> People from all of people, all whose names you would recognize from our field, um, all interested in talking about human needs, and there was a certain amount of interesting talk that preceded Johan's presentation. And um, but interesting, but I must say a little abstract. They're quite philosophical. Um, and Johan, although no stranger to philosophy, um, got up and I remember it as very clearly and said, well, this has all been very interesting, but I haven't heard anything yet about the heron and the knecht. I haven't heard anything yet about the haves and the have-nots. And he said, if you lose track of the, if you lose sight of the fact that the great division in the world is between the haves and the have-nots, then if you lose sight of that fact, then you have nothing. Then what you're doing here is worthless. It all has to be related to that. And then he proceeded to relate human, basic human needs in his conception of it to the structural issues. And uh, I decided right then and there, this was a man I wanted to know. And uh, I've been happy to be able to know him ever since. It's been a, kind of a while <laughs> since that time. Anyway, I'm not going to uh, introduce him any more than that to say that, the, this, that Johan is one of the people in the field who best combines um, theoretical profundity and complexity with a passion for social justice. Um, and um, 
He's my hero. <laughs> so what can I, what else can I tell you? Uh, so we're very interested to see what he has to say. Joe Yohan's just come back for some trips to interesting places, and I invited him to say something about that if, there, if he wants to and if he has time. Um, so we're all ears, Johan. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks indeed, dear Rich, my wonderful friend. And let me also express my gratitude to GMU. I started here in 95 as a visiting professor teaching a term. That was a delight. And one morning in our mailbox there was a prospect for some townhouse up in Manassas. And that was a Sunday, Fimi and I decided to visit it in order to find out how the, how the natives live these days, you know, sort of anthropology. And that afternoon we had bought the apartment. So it was impulse buying. And for that reason, I'm extremely happy about it. We are here a couple of months, one month, a couple of weeks, and so on, every year. I'm very grateful <coughs> for the contact with GMU. And we find the place ideal, absolutely ideal. To the east, we have Washington, the, um, where we can measure the temperature of the flames of the empire, temperature going down. To the west we have the beautiful Shenandoah, mm -hmm. to the north we have Yankeelandia, mm -hmm. and to the south we have Virginia, which I just simply love, for its history, and because that is where I had the first mediation in my life, which was Charlottesville, Virginia. And it was certainly about segregation integration, and in 1958 I ended up on the first page of Washington Post, for the first and last time in my life, <laughs> something like Norwegian sociologist uh, proposes a solution in Charlottesville, something like that. So this is where it all started, <laughs> and I'm most grateful. I have a message today in two words, and I'm going to say it very many times, solution orientation. Solution orientation. And I have been living my life on two tracks. One as a professor of peace studies, and the other one as a peace practitioner. So let me now try to see if I manage this fantastic Can you all hear all right? I have been given instructions. Let's see if we get a mic. So let us say that we have two tracks, and we can just call them theory and practice. And in theory, analysis, but I'll call it diagnosis. This is very high. Prognosis is somewhat lowish, and therapy is almost missing. So the theory is in the traditional academic way of doing things. You do analysis with research methodology, and you link data and theory. You can do it inductively and deductively, and if you do both, and you have some new data and you have some new theory, you become a professor. <laughs> it's practically speaking inevitable, I guarantee you. If you do much other than that, you may get into difficulties. Mm -hmm. So now let us say that you have the people engaged in peace practice. The analysis, the, uh, oh, no, it feels very advanced. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll manage, I'll learn. The diagnosis part is usually very low. And you find all kinds of alliances for peace work and things of that kind with sloppy analysis. The prognosis is usually better, and it is usually that if you continue the way you do, it will end up very badly, whereupon they jump into therapy with very little foundation. So the point now is, if you can combine these two columns, so that you end up with a fairly balanced DPT, the medical sounding terms, Diagnosis, prognosis, therapy. 
that I stand for. But I have been instructed that if I don't like this color, I can change the color at any time. But I think it is okay. Let's just think of that. It won't change what's already on there, but now the next thing you write. The next thing we do that. Okay. <laughs> so, where did I get DPT from? I heard it when I was two years old, because my father and mother, one being a physician, the other one being a nurse, the daughter of the director of health in Norway, they were talking about that incessantly. So I picked up the words. And I use it as a kind of indication of something psychologists seem to me to have missed. The importance of dinner table conversation when you are a little child. It shapes us. So I'm going now to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about it in detail. But I'll um, first give you just some words about Transcend, the organization. It has two levels. It's a network. And it was started in 1993, so we just celebrated the 20th anniversary. That's about 520 members. Members are by invitation. The kind of people we want to avoid is the pure theoretician and the pure practitioner. We would like to have people who have some leg in both camps. Not necessarily balanced, but some idea about it. We have 20 countries that are functioning quite well. And let me just say that I think one reason why they're functioning is that we never had any money. Money corrupts. And money makes you dependent. And all these countries have somehow found their own money. Let me take one as an example. Let me take United States of America, where Diane Perlman is an excellent convener on the East Coast, and Mary Langlow is... You'll have to speak very close to it. Let us see. I'm not so sure it's only a question of closeness. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is some more basic problems on me. <laughs> Maybe it needs some time. Look, this happens in all countries. It has nothing to do with it. I'm just from Colombia, just coming from Bogota were in front of me, invited by the local FBI, and in front of me were 320 FBI people. And I'll tell you about that, what you do in that situation. But is there any way of getting this a little bit more operation? Uh, you are not there. Uh -huh. Yeah, there is life, there is organic life. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay, fine, thank you so much indeed, thank you. The point about it now is simply that we have, of course, on the West Coast, and you can guess where it is, it is close to Berkeley, Mary Langloy, another lady, who is doing superb work on high tea, and above all, on relationships in the US, very much linked to the Mondragon cooperative movement in Spain and trying to launch cooperatives as a way of decreasing inequality in the US. And Diane, in addition to organizing sessions with me, is very much a theoretician practitioner in her own right, doing marvelous work centered on Washington and to some extent Philadelphia. We tried to get something in the heartland of America, USA, more particularly Greensboro, North Carolina. And the idea was to bring to the heartland a little element of brain, so that you could have heart and brainland. <laughs> now, the brain was rejected very quickly, and it didn't quite work out, so it remains a heartland. And the conception at the University of Peace is what Fumi and I call the holding hands conception. So you have beautiful black and white children lined up in schools with an assistant professor of peace studies, teaching them to hold hands and sing songs together. 
Now I'll come back to that because, um, and I think I can say it immediately. When I say solution orientation, I try to point out that there is a conflict triangle called ABC. Attitude, behavior is the thing that is very easy to understand. The problem comes with the word with a C, with a contradiction. Now, it is V for behavior, A for attitude, C for contradiction, but only B is observable. A is inferred, contradiction is inferred. So this is what I work with analytically. Conflict equals A plus B plus C. C contradiction means, aha, uh -huh, you have one goal, something you want, you want that one. Doesn't come together, they exclude each other, incompatibility. This is where it all starts. So when I and my Mexican friend, who is head of Transcend Mexico, Latin America, Fernando Montiel, doing a fantastic job, I'll come to it a little bit later. When we entered the room for FBI in Colombia, the first thing I saw was the word post-conflict, which is a word I hate. It's an Anglo-American misunderstanding that makes any work in this field, practically speaking, impossible. Right. Practically speaking, impossible. Conflict and violence are two very different things. Right now they have a, um, an arms fired, and they are negotiating in Havana, as you all know. And they have six points on the agenda, I'm coming back to that one. But you see, there is no such thing as post-conflict. I said in the beginning, I guarantee you, you will have problems between have and have nots for the coming centuries. But you can reduce it. You can move in the right direction. You don't have to do like the USA does, namely moving in the wrong direction, increasing inequality all the time. You could pay attention to the fact that all the BRICS countries, B for Brazil, R for Russia, not India, C for China, S for South Africa, have had major leaps towards equality recently. And Colombia is not on it. Now, if you say post-conflict, you confuse it with violence, B, behavior, because you can observe it, and you take away from yourself the possibility of asking yourself, where is the contradiction? Where is the incompatibility? And how can I make it compatible? In other words, you detach yourself from the way out of the dilemma. And instead of that, what you will do is to monitor that the ceasefire is being kept, and you think you have solved the problem. Now this, unfortunately, is the Western official peace theory separate them. And when I say solution orientation, it is C-oriented entirely. And my empirical experience these last 60 years, I've been working 62 years in this field, since 1951, most of you were not born at that time. You were born, were you? Oh, yeah. You were born. I, yeah. Was, I was bar mitzvah that year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I, now, <coughs> if you do that, you simply, that's the empirical thesis underlying all my work. When you have violence, identify the underlying unsolved conflict. When you have identified the underlying unsolved conflict, solve it. If it doesn't work, go back to point one. You may have identified wrongly. So the trick then is to have sufficient sense of the social organism to find out where that conflict is located. 
And I can tell you immediately for Colombia, there is no particular relationship between inequality and narco-traffic. No particular relationship. But there is a relationship between inequality and the violence they have had. And are having, and if they are not going to address it, my message is very clear, you'll get it again. It'll pop up. Here I am. You forgot me, did you? Okay. You see, by saying post-conflict, you fall into the trap of believing that things are solved when there is no more any violence. So that's, of course, like believing that when the fever has gone, the patient is okay, is healthy. Let me now say, we have 20 countries doing very interesting work. Let me go to my own, Norway. But first say that Mexico is particularly strong on peace education and judicial mediation. And is launching at the top level of Mexico a peace center, not only for Mexico as a whole, but for the 34 parts of Mexico. In Norway, the people there have focused entirely on schools and getting rid of mobbing, bullying, and have succeeded fantastically. Let me just tell you in one sentence what the key is. The teacher identifies a bad boy. Let us say this one. <laughs> and he's used to him being a bad boy. He goes to him, takes him by the ear, in order to bring him to the principal director. But before that he says the sentence, and we were discussing about one year. What is it the teacher says to the bad boy? He says, what you have done is totally unacceptable, comma, but why did you do it? In other words, you start with B, saying this is unacceptable, but why did you do it? and you come to A and C. And I can just act for you one particular scene, which is kind of impressive. The bully, the bad boy, had frightened a little girl who had her first day in school, frightened the wits out of her by saying, boo, 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 behind her. <laughs> and she had, of course, stormed back to her house and hidden herself under the quilt, left the school. And the teacher, and came to the bad boy. And uh, there was no answer. Why did you do it? And he asked again, why did you do it? What was happening inside you? No answer. And then suddenly the answer came. I hate school. <laughs> Can you tell me why you hate school? It's only blah, 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 and you are about the worst one. There is never anything I can do with my hands. It's only blah, 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 the whole thing. Okay, but what does that have to do with that little girl? She loves school, I can see it from her eyes. <laughs> she is a school lover. In other words, a traitor to the trade union of school haters. <laughs> well, I have found that being the basic theme around the world. Bullying is school haters against school lovers, demanding their loyalty. And you don't come very far by investigating what happened in their family when he was three years old. It's a matter of fact that maybe it is not at the micro level, but at the meso level of the school system. The point is located. Now I can tell you one thing, the school superintendent doesn't love that kind of analysis. He might be willing to go for the point of a bad teacher. The teacher doesn't like that type of analysis. So the teacher might like to push it onto the parents. The parents might like to push it onto the relationship between the bully and the bully and try to find something there. And in doing so, there is much work for psychologists. Psychologists don't like my approach because they see good honoraria disappearing. Since the school system is a marvelous source of income for psychologists who understand next to nothing of the social aspect. 
But having said that, I'm just trying to dig into some of the things going on. We have 20 countries that are doing well, 520 members. Then we have a center which right now happens to be in Basel, in the, uh, the actually the German part of Basel. Basel is, as you know, a city in three countries, mainly Switzerland and then Germany and France. It's itself a city that bridges antagonisms and is doing that with some talent. And in that one we have Trans and Peace University doing online courses. We have had about 1,000 participants. We have Transcend University Press, and I think just by chance, Diane has a couple of the books there. Just by chance, and I have some propaganda here. <laughs> Transcend University Press, and we have now published 22 books, and we have decided to put the temporary ceiling at 25. In addition to that, we have Transcend Media Service, where I write an editorial every Monday, which usually is reproduced in about 70 countries. And that brings us immediately to the problem, where have we had success and where not? Not success in the West, success in the rest. It's a clear West-Rest division. The people knocking at our door being curious, knowing, asking for advice, and mainly from the rest. However, the last half a year this has changed. This has changed in the sense of getting invitation even to the deep west, not the deepest. <laughs> there are two countries that have never invited me. United States of America and my own country. <laughs> my own country I understand perfectly well, they are too afraid of me. That I understand. I know what they're in for, and it might also be that my own country stimulates some aggressive parts in me. Could be more than U.S. Now, let me put it this way, and I'll give you immediately the list of the last five months. In July, I gave a talk in Italian in the Italian Senate in Rome, the upper house of the parliament. What did they ask me to talk about? It was not for the whole Senate, it was for the Defense, Foreign Affairs, and European Union Committee. 90 people in the room. And they asked me to talk about alternative systems of defense. And I talked about defensive defense and conflict resolution. A half an hour talk. We had a beautiful debate, we had a beautiful dinner afterwards, and one of the senators said to me, there is nobody in parliament who believes the Russians are coming. There is nobody in parliament who believes that the Muslims are going to attack us. But we need your type of arguments because we have been commissioned by the European Union to be the country coming up with new ideas. So why do we have all that hardware? Why do we have submarines and things of that kind? For prestige reasons. I said, he said, a little bit similar to the end of colonialism. You know, they didn't believe in colonialism any longer, but they didn't get rid of the colonies because you had to be a member of the club of colonial powers. And he said, exactly. My father was a leading Italian politician at the time. It's exactly the same mentality. But don't they see the handwriting on the wall? That this state system, belligerent, is coming to an end. Yes, they said, he said, but you know, the point is to have arguments, and the point is to have successor system. Okay. And I'll make a little jump to the 1st of October. But before I do that, let me just stop in Malaysia. I think Malaysia is today possibly the leading country in peace studies and peace practice. I don't think anyone in the room knows about it. It is due to Mahathir Mohammed, who was the fourth prime minister of independent Malaysia. So it's called more or less the Mahathir Mohammed School of Peace Studies. They are more audacious than, for instance, I am. 
They simply say war is a crime. Whoever launches a war is a criminal and should be treated as such. Now, he's usually very well defended in his own country, but we can do it by cutting down on his travel routines, by making participating countries arrest him at the airport. In other words, the approach that was launched against Pinochet. It's the Pinochet model. So not only to say war is a crime, but to arrest those who launch it. With the 247 military interventions from the United States since Jefferson started in 1805, in Libya by the way, there are enough criminals waiting for arrest from the US and Malaysia is keeping track of the names. <laughs> now how far down you go, I mean you have a president, you have secretary of state, you have uh, defense, uh, and you have sub-secretaries, and you have assistant secretaries, and you have members of the National Council, Security Council, and of course you have the whole NSA, CAA, top, and so on. How far down you go can be discussed, and they're discussing that. Where do we draw the line? We cannot arrest all of them. But I just give you the kind of approach that you find. So they are organizing big things and they are training diplomats and scholars all over Southeast Asia. Now, Southeast Asia, we have a number of transcend countries, and they have made peace journalism loom high. Why is peace journalism so popular in Southeast Asia? That it doesn't reach the West is obvious. It's because many of the wars in Southeast Asia are civil wars, internal wars. That is particularly the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. It could have been in Malaysia if Mahathir Mohammed hadn't found the prevention of it. The war would have been the same as an Indonesian genocide against Chinese in 1966 with the help of Rand Corporation and CIA identifying Chinese military to start with as agents of the People's Republic in order to set up a communist country in Indonesia. If there was anything Indonesia didn't want, it was any kind of Chinese takeover. Any kind of it, including the Chinese colonels in the army. But the analytical gift is not something you find at top of Washington. You don't find it. I can come and give you many examples, but we can come back to that. The point about it is just simply the following. You have a formula which is a recipe for disaster. A minority which is high in economic and cultural things. Commands so enterprises, companies. Commands of culture, but low, politically military. And you have the overwhelming majority of the country that has the political military power in their hands. But they cannot compete with the minority, culturally, economically. You will understand that this is Armenia versus Turkey. <coughs> You will of course understand that it is Jews in Germany versus Germans. It is Tutsis versus Hutu. It is Chinese versus the majority in Indonesia and in Malaysia and in the Philippines. In the Philippines less, in Indonesia very much so. And the cases I mentioned led to genocide. Now, what Mahathir did was an act of genius. He said, instead of hitting the Chinese, let us lift up the Malays. So positive discrimination of the Muslim Malays, they got the enormous amount of positive discrimination in terms of economics and in terms of culture. 
In other words, he was striving for equality. When I met him first time, which was in August this year, I congratulated him and said about something like this. And he said, is that what I was doing? Thank you so much for explaining to me what I did. I can tell you it was totally out of intuition. Let us work positively instead of negatively. Now, if you have that, it's a disaster. Germany had it, and I'll immediately make my point about the US. Jews come out of the German experience, I think to a large extent with the idea we have to have command of the political and the military too. The way that is happening in the US right now is to have Christian Zionists, evangelicals at the top of the military, and to buy the politicians. This is not the way out. It's not the way out. It spells disaster, or let us put it differently, it's some kind of unstable equilibrium that is doomed to disequilibrate, hopefully not with violence. So having said that, I say things that are unpalatable to some people, not to others. Others understand it. And I can only say, say, for heaven's sake, if you want to get out of this dilemma, try to convince Goldman Sachs to be number one in stopping speculation. Try to convince Goldman Sachs about that. Try to share more equitably the positions of cultural command. If you don't do it, okay, things may happen. I don't want them to happen. So for that reason, we are settled here with major problems. And a little country called Malaysia did very well on that one. And they are preaching this kind of thing all over the world now in addition to criminalizing war. So having to said that, I think I can only say one little point about our experience, the 20 years. We found it transcend as a network of peace, development, and environment, based on two experiences that were not entirely negative, but not positive enough. One was the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, founded in January 59 by private money by somebody whose entrepreneurial conservative thinking was very far from my own but he said through his son who was the director of the Institute for Social Research which was a kind of imitation of the corresponding thing in Michigan in Ann Arbor he said this sculptor is an entrepreneur. It's a tragedy, he's not in business. He could have done well if he were in business. And he's in this stupid thing called peace studies. But I recognize an entrepreneur when I see one. Okay, here's the check. The check had absolutely no ties to it. We were so successful that the government decided to take us over. And after that, difficulties came. Now one difficulty is called democracy. And you see the point is this, that when conservative politicians in the parliament read about what we were proposing and things of that kind, insane things like, for instance, a nuclear test ban, we were very much in favor of Kennedy Khrushchev's initiative. When they read about that, they said, no more money to that institute. In other words, the political space was limited. <coughs> so we then made a second experiment, university, like here. And we had academic freedom. Could say what we wanted, could also do a lot of things. But I remember myself spending as much time as a university professor on getting 20 square meter more of space for a secretary or something that I spent on the Cold War. <laughs> now, you can say Cold War was even more important, and of course I could do it without those 20 square meters. 
we also spend quite a lot of time with other departments that wanted to defend their turf. You don't go into psychological conflicts. You know nothing about psychology. That's our turf. Well, I said my experience is that conflicts between husband and wife have some similarity with, with let us say, conflict between Peru and Ecuador. And maybe I can learn something from one and take it to the other. They're totally different. Keep sticky, stay off. Now, that argument never impressed me, but um, I felt, in a sense, that the network of committed people was the way out. And to now stop with that, let me just say one sentence. That worked very well for 15 years. Up to 2008, what happened in 2008? People had less money, bought less books, and didn't go to workshops or buy courses. In other words, an economic crisis. We are trying to find our way out of it, but let me only say that that happened to us too. Let me now stop at that point and bring you up to what has happened recently. And I'll stop then and just give you an image. 1st, 2nd and 3rd October in Mexico. There is something called the Estado de Mexico which is very close to the federal district. And they don't call themselves Mexicanos, but they call themselves Mexicenses, which seems to be Mexico at a higher level or something like that. There's a slight arrogance in it. They have a capital called Toluca. Toluca has decided to launch peace studies, peace practice in all their schools. I was addressing 2,000 teachers from kindergarten to university in an enormous auditorium. If you want to teach peace to the kids, what do you teach? And I said, okay, here you have a formula. And the formula is the one which has four terms to it, happens to be maybe the one that I believe particularly in and find useful. It's a fraction. And I can put it on the blackboard immediately. But the point about it is that it has been the result of 60 years' work. And it has, let us write it. Peace, pay for peace equals, then comes a fraction. Equity times empathy divided by trauma times conflict. So you have paxogens in the numerator and bellogens in the denominator. Equity means you set up a relationship between the parties. Equitable. Another way of phrasing it is more understandable. Cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. Mutual and equal benefit. Where did I get that from? I got it from Zhu and Lai Nehru in 1954, Panchila, preparing for the Bandung Conference. I didn't get it from the West. Capitalism has cooperation for mutual benefit. I pay you 10 cents an hour. If you don't like it, just leave and starve to death. So it happens that I end up as a billionaire. There is an element of mutual benefit, but as we all know very well, not quite equal. The other term is not behavioral, but attitudinal. Try to learn what the other party wants. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the other party as a condition for harmony. So if you take it from the triangle, in the numerator you have A for attitude, B for, B for behavior, sorry, A for attitude. In the denominator you have C for contradiction. 
You had a contradiction of the past, which has been sedimented as trauma. You had a contradiction of the present and the future, which is called conflict. So if you want peace, build equity, distribute empathy, reconcile traumas of the past, and resolve conflicts as they come. It is quite interesting to have 2,000 professors pulling out their pens and their sheets of paper. And then we were discussing, how do you convey this to a 12 years old boy, a 6 years old girl, a 2 years old boy in kindergarten? In Norway, this project is now in kindergarten too. And the point about it is this, that what we do, it's often starting with bullying. And we have the bully and the bully explaining their situation in the class. We don't ask them to sit down together. But the school has given the teachers two hours every week for what they call sabona, S-A-B-O-N-A, -A, which is the Sulu greeting word saying, you are in me. And the other one answering, Sabona, you are in me. Sabona. Where did we take it from? From Africa. Now, it's a question of running around the world and picking up good ideas where you find them. Well, that's one way of doing it. So, we are now having an excellent session in March, where 25 people at top of the school system in Estado de Mexico will be trained by me in these four things with role playing and that will go on for two weeks but then Mexican members of Transcend will have a sort of um, tutorial I'll teach three hours plus three hours per day and then will, they will teach three hours in the middle this is simply becoming politics it's becoming policy and it will probably distribute itself slowly to 33 other parts of Mexico. The Minister of Education has said the present generation of politicians is probably lost. Let them retire. We focus on the young generation. Now, they're not totally lost, but this is the point. I traveled from there to Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO. And the meeting of Shanghai Cooperation Organization was in Rodos in the Eastern Mediterranean, a part of Greece. It was the 11th annual session. I had been to a couple before. And I was invited to give a vision of the world in 2015. And I made a list of wishes. But the point about it is that then I did a second thing. I said, you might find this a little bit too much. Now, let's have a look backwards. What happened during the last 40 years? End of colonialism. All colonial empires gone. End of the Soviet Empire. There's only one left, the US Empire. In a sick situation. It is going very, very quickly. I just remind you that the difference between a colony and empire is that in a colony you have your own people at the top. In an empire, you have paid elites. The elites are no longer taking it. Look at Latin America. The Secretary of State, Kerry, declared the end of the Monroe Doctrine last week. I didn't find any report in Washington Post. It was a sensation in Mexico 
the whole first page dedicated to it. Now, having said that, the room was swarming with Chinese. Impeccably dressed like a diplomat, as it's just not my style. <laughs> Talking fantastic Russian and English with American accent. Russians, both of them projecting their visions of the world, which is intergovernmental, interstate, sitting down, searching for win-win situations, making treaties and pacts bilaterally and multilaterally. They are firm believers in the state system and in the idea of striking agreements for mutual and equal benefit, win-win, and for that reason, going together. Okay, I'm not going into details. I sensed optimism in the room, optimism in Mexico. I moved immediately to a place of deep pessimism. The European Union State Department. The State Department is not called State Department. It is called EEAS, the European External Affairs Service. You know, all these old imperial institutions, they're always calling themselves service. Somehow, <laughs> somehow service always pops up. EEAS. They were desperate. And here comes another interesting point. And I transcend and I myself have not arrived in the West. And you will be quite astonished when you hear the rest of this story. I could put it this way. They are so desperate that they even go to a guy like me. And if they do that, <laughs> the situation must be pretty bad. They say, we are stuck. We hear all kinds of rumors, Galtung, about what you are doing with a small organization with no money. How do you do it? So I first had a session with the head of EEAS. The super head is the Baroness, who is corresponding to the Secretary of State. She was possibly the only one not present. The head was a Frenchman. How do you do it? I say, okay, roughly speaking, I do the following. I talk with all parties. I ask them to state what they want. What does the Afghanistan look like where you would like to live? Or that you would like to see? Also people from the outside. Then I look at what they want. And I test it for legitimacy. I first do that by myself. Secondly, I might bring it out to them. And I have three criteria of legitimacy. That what you want is legal, is compatible with human rights, compatible with basic needs. Legality, human rights, basic needs. If they pass all three tests, I have no problem. Usually they pass two of them. With the legal code, I have the problem that it usually is the institutionalization of the upper classes view of society as it should be to freeze it for the future. The legal code is problematic, but the human rights are not about that. They're problematic because they're basically Western. That only means they're incomplete. Basic needs are more solid, but they're not institutional. And the third point is that you very carefully propose a solution. And you propose it with a question mark in the beginning and at the end, as you can do in Spanish, and in the subjunctive mode. And for that reason, English is not a good language for mediation. Much better is a language with subjunctive. German, French, Italian, Spanish, Arabic, Russian. And as I often say, Japanese is hopeless because there's only subjunctive mode. 
nothing is certain, and sometimes you may have to state a couple of small facts, like it is now 13 minutes past one o'clock, for instance. Not, it may be 13 past one o'clock. <laughs> Having said that, <coughs> he was laughing and said, okay, give me a short list of your successes. Said, yes. So I had a short list of 30, and I mentioned them. I'll not go into it in time for details. So this was brought to his inner circle that had different parts of the world as their specialty. And to say his conclusion first, at this point he said, Johan, he said, not even you would have been able to do this with 28 ambassadors on your shoulders. 28 members of the European Union. And those 28 ambassadors have their own agendas, particularly in parts of the world that they once dominated. And I said, but don't you solve that in general by saying, Spain, you do what you want in Latin America as long as you don't mess into what we, England and France, don't do in Africa. It's okay, you go ahead as long as you don't mix into Latin America and things of that kind. A gentleman's agreement, yeah, between mafia bosses. And uh, we all agree, try to keep the Americans out. And the problem is Middle East. So, yes, he said, that worked for some time, it doesn't work any longer. They all want to have their foot everywhere. So how do you handle that one? Now, here are our specialists. The first one was a former agent for the secret police of his country. I prefer not to tell you which country it was. A former ambassador to Hong Kong, coming straight out of the secret police, of a member of the European Union. And he had very strong ideas about Korea, China, the Southeast Sea, China Sea, about Sri Lanka, about Myanmar, about, Mon yeah, about that, essentially. Now these are places where I had been working very much, I knew in and out. And I must have said that he was rather flat after he had talked with me. I may have been merciless, and they may have done the following, which is the key to the transcend method. It's a, co it's a combination of negative prognosis and positive prognosis. The negative prognosis is, this will make the situation worse. The positive prognosis is, here is what I propose. If you want to solve Korea, it is not between South and North Korea. It's between North Korea and the US. And you have managed to talk about Korea for 15 minutes, not saying one word about the US hatred of North Korea, for having been the first country since 1812 that didn't capitulate to the US. A visceral hatred. The US could normalize the situation establish diplomatic relations, which it will do sooner or later. The rest are blueberries, are small things. Now, if you continue along that line, you get worse. If you solve it, I'll give you the following 10 reasons why it'll get better. Some of them are quite detailed. After that, the specialist on Africa was very modest in what he said and the specialist on Latin America even more so. But then they all turned against me for good reasons. Okay, 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 okay. 28 ambassadors on top of you, how do you handle that? I'll tell you what my answer was. You send people to and he be so kind and understand the difference between a conflict formation and a conflict area. The conflict area is where the conflict shows up. So if you have shooting between North and South Korea, you may believe that that's where the conflict is. Yes, the conflict is partly there. But the formation, the US ranks high. 
You send people to South Korea, North Korea and US. You also send them to Russia and Japan and China so that you have all the six members of the six state conference in it. You ask them, what do you like to see? You keep track of all they like to see. You then have your mediators come together and try to use their creativity to come up with something that might modestly satisfy all of them. I can make a prediction for you. The most difficult country will not be United States of America, but Japan. And I can tell you why if you want to. You send them there. You come up with a proposal. But all of this is just preliminary, you see? You don't have any mandate. Don't, for heaven's sake, don't ask for a mandate. The moment you have a mandate from the Commission, from the European Union, or from the EEAS, you are probably lost. But you should have the freedom to explore what they want and what you might see as possibilities. On that basis, you ask for a mandate. So this was an effort to be constructive, as you see. So you can say that what I do is to say things that are not uh, very well, very popular. And then I try to convince them that I am good at the bottom. I try to say, just wait a little bit, ten more minutes, I guarantee you, I'll come up with something positive. This idea is now circulating all over. But before it started circulating, I said, Look, Norway is not a member of the European Union. I'm a Norwegian, keep that out of it. Why is it that it so happens that you have 28 ambassadors with different views and you end up with American foreign policy? <laughs> Why is it that when you design the university system, you had a competition between three famous systems, the English, the French, and the German. And you ended up with the American system. Why is that? Well, it's subservience to the US, you are fascinated with it, but it's also lack of creativity. It's the lazy man's way out. And to have 28 lazy nations sitting there opting for the American is not a triumph. So if you want my reading of EEAS, it is not European External Affairs Service, but European External American Service. It's my reading of that acronym. So I say things like that, horrible things, terrible things. And I also announce that my way of being diplomat is to be undiplomatic. But it will end well. Well, my dear friends, it works. But you have to have good proposals in the end. So I make a jump. I went to the next stage, which was in Bucharest, and met one more pessimistic group. 50 NATO generals. <coughs> 50 NATO generals. Of course, the important ones were three star. And the one star were the ones you put at the back of the room. I mean, these are not people you talk with. You're three star, two star. You have to have some criteria here in the world. The three stars also announced very clearly that they were important. And they had three stars. So, what do I, as a conscientious objector, <laughs> having served half a year in prison, wanting peace service, not stupid alternative service, what do I have to do with 15 NATO generals? Well, these are not retired, they are not active, and they are reserve officers. And what they told me was the following. Professor Galton, the Cold War is over. We don't believe in these so-called missions in Afghanistan or whatever it is. We simply don't believe in it. It doesn't work. We are fighting real people who are fighting for their things. Some of them are not very good, but how do we do it? Could you be so kind, Professor Galton, to come up with a program of peace education for generals in the reserve? Mm -hmm. Now, 
I, I had never imagined that would happen in my life, you see. Uh, what are you saying? Well, the person who said it was a lieutenant colonel, a Romanian, very charming lady, lieutenant colonel, so she had, you know, only silver stars, but two silver hands and two stars. My father taught me all these things when I was uh, six years old or something, so I can see them immediately. And they haven't changed. They all come from France, and they're all imitating the French pattern of the 18th century. And they all have a Napoleonic touch to them. <laughs> yeah. Now, having said that, I designed a program for them. And it was these four points. I find it useful. Four tasks. Now be aware that the one at, on the left in the denominator can be a little bit problematic. Because sometimes you have to confront your own past. I had long talks with the two-star general from the Pentagon. And I'll not say more because I don't want you to identify him. And when I came to that point in the denominator, he said a memorable phrase. Johan, this may be the most difficult point for us. We Americans are not good at confronting our past. I find that a remarkably insightful sentence. And I said at our next meeting, could we maybe talk about what to do about it? The next meeting did not take place because a three-star general had forbidden him from talking with me. He had found that I did not have a good influence on him. Now, we leave that aside. I mean, there are stars in this world, and in the U.S. it goes up to four stars and five stars. So there's still some stars to go, if you want. I can only say I found it fantastic. And from that point on, we move on to the next meeting, the last one, which was with 350 professors in Beograd. I was with my own. I found it boring. It was about the future of the Balkans and the future of North-South relations. <coughs> and you see, what I found was that they had no touch with reality. The average professor has a name for reality. It's called a library. <laughs> it's a very interesting name for reality. And there he finds reports about reality. It is this touch with the real problems of the people who are there trying to work it out, which is important. So I'll now say one word about the elites. There are many of them that I have met in my life. There are good sides and bad sides. Most critics should be aware of the fact that they wouldn't survive one single day in that person's chair. They are dealing with problems so difficult that it's hard to imagine. And I often take as example Charles V. In 1517 in Madrid, waking up in the morning, and his assistant number one came to him with the agenda for the day. Your Majesty, there are three points. There is somebody called Bartolomé de las Casas who has written an evil book about what we are doing in South America. They're saying that we are killing people, doing it's all kinds of nonsense in the book. Then there is a monk in Germany called Martin Luther who is challenging the whole Holy Roman Church. And problem number three, with whom are you going to marry your daughter? I think, according to the historian, Charles V focused on problem number three. He took the most important one, and so the other ones as rather peripheral. Now, he may be critiqued, but wake up in the morning with those three pure problems. And in addition, knowing very little about how to handle traumas and conflicts. Great. I move on to the last one, and that's the one I came back from Saturday to get with Fernando, 
the extremely talented head of the Mexican or a blood missile Latin American transcend. So, Johann Galtung, Professor Galtung, we are lost. And you have followed our country since 1962. And we now are in a situation we simply don't want to know what to do. What to do. What can police do if there is an agreement in Havana? So let me jump immediately. I'll not repeat the evil things I said, let me only say. Could you please stop talking about post-conflict? You are absolutely right in saying that one of the tasks of police is security. Security is the answer to direct violence. There is structural violence. The answer to structural violence is called equality. Now, you are never going to get absolute security. And my friends, you were not even able to predict the murder of Gaitan, the Colombian trade union leader, 9th of April, 1948. And the effect of that was a wave of violence where 250,000 were killed, called La Violencia. You were not even able to predict that one. And you were not able to predict FARC, F-A-R-C, from the mid-60s. So don't only talk about an end to violence and security. Talk about reducing structural violence and what he called. And let us not hope, now hope, for Havana. Point one on the agenda is very promising. It says, Desarrollo Agrario Integral, Integrated Agrarian Development. And here's my point, I said, lift the bottom up. For heaven's sake, don't bring in corporations to modernize agriculture. Lift the bottom up with small cooperatives with sales points, with three-dimensional agriculture, with aquaculture. Give them a credit, which they will pay back within five years. Practice Marxist attachment to basic needs and combine it with liberal attachment to the free market when they have the money to participate. And your economy will run better. If you have more and more people see sinking out of the economy through inequality, it will be worse and worse. Now they said, but equality, you can never get absolute equality. And I said, you can never get absolute security either. They're not that different. So if there is an agreement, your task is to police the agreement, that both sides stick to it. And you know perfectly well that the most likely infraction of the agreement will be a military coup. Now it so happened that you yourself are under the, mil under the Department of Defense, and you are not called inspectors and things like that that I'm used to for European countries. You're called generals and colonels. And when I'm addressing my host here, I say, mi coronel, my colonel. You know. So, yeah, well, they, they took it. They took it. And here are two concrete suggestions. Learn from the Japanese. The most fascinating police I know in the world. For each police office have a mediation room. And when two people are fighting in the street, take them by the ear like two bad boys. And put them in the mediation room and ask them, what's the problem? And you pour oceans of tea, like Chinese do, like Japanese do. There is a quarter in the third floor of the same building. Bring them down. Do that. Learn from the Japanese police. Learn from the Indian police on the west coast of India. I have talked with many of them. And they say, Professor Galtung, you see, we have the Naxalite rebellion. And you know, our task is to arrest the, the terrorists. And we know who they are. They're living in that part of the slum and in that uh, miserable hut and so we can arrest them. But our experience is that when we have arrested 10 of them, 100 more come up. Doesn't help very much. So we have decided rather to go to them and ask them, what's the problem? And we have found that question much better. 
What is the image you have of a good village? And the Fumi has suggested that CIA, instead of waterboarding and torture, would have come much further by asking the people they captured, what's the image you have of a good Pakistan, a good Afghanistan, a good world, and take it from there. Forget all the time about waterboarding, just simply enter into a dialogue. So, okay, 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 give us more ideas. They say yes, your task is to police the Havana Agreement. I'm not a party to it, that's the government and FARC. But let us say that I'm a third party representing neither the government nor FARC, but representing peace. Here is what I have been proposing for the six parts. That has no political weight whatsoever. But you have to police the agreement. Point two. There is something that unites us all in the world. A guide, a moral ethical guide. It's called human rights. And you are more or less good at civil political, not perfect. You are extremely bad at social economic culture. Now you have signed and ratified both of them. That means, since you're not practicing them, that Colombia is not a state with rule of law since human rights today have priority over even your own constitution. Which incidentally also means that the United States is not a system with rule of law. Now, I'm of course now talking somewhat future. It's established by the UN, but that hasn't penetrated. You might be interested in policing to what extent the government is in conformity with the rule of law. And I was quoting from his and my daughter Irene, who is a specialist at the world level, about the judiciability, the education possibility for the right to food and water. That right, according to, and I'll stop at this point, according to Irene, 832 million people starving equals 832 million court cases the title of her master's thesis. Of these 832 million court cases, we have had one. Not one million, but one. The relatives of a person starving to death against the Indian government. And they won. And the Indian government, on the basis of that single case, introduced school luncheons all over India. No, one avenue. Now you police, <laughs> you are the so-called intelligentsia. Um, you are paid by the government. You have a problem there. So I just mentioned it to you, that that could be an interesting task. Having said that, my last proposal is, be present, be helpful to the citizens. Don't only distribute fines, but stop a car and tell the driver, you really did that roundabout marvelously. Here is a little star for you. When you have 10 of them, come to our office and there may be some gift for you. You know, the positive approach. And I mentioned in my little, famous and my little town called Alfas, is that CIA cutting off? <laughs> we stop now, we stop now. I guarantee you. Called Alfas, uh, which incidentally has dedicated a park, uh, the Park for Peace, Johan Galton, which is kind of nice. But outside the pharmacy, in the roundabout, there is a guy called Jose, meaning Pepe. Pepe is the nickname for Jose. A little bit fat. He's not quite in good shape these days. And he's the one supervising the traffic, instead of being on a motorbike with blue lights, exuding authority. So we call him Tio Pepe. 
Uncle Pepe. And that may be the best thing you can do if you want to be in Afghanistan or something like that to send a Tio Pepe battalion. Maybe there will be a pistol behind, a pistol or two, but that's the maximum. You exude authority and helpfulness. So I left Saturday and here I am and I have a feeling of having arrived. And we'll see what happens next. Full stop. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. It took only 60 years of work. <laughs> Comments, questions? <laughs>